Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the today's uh, Cafe Scientific. Uh, I'm Digbir Jais, Vice President of Research and International at the University of Manitoba. I would like to begin uh, by acknowledging that the University of Manitoba is on the original lands of Anisna Bay, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these uh, territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Welcome to our third and final Cafe Scientific for the 2020. We will begin again in January. Tonight's topic is one close to my heart as both as a scientist and as a consumer, eating the whole grains in Canada's food guide. Tonight's panel includes experts in their fields, two faculty members joined by an alumna of the university. Under the guidance of your moderator this evening, they will share their expertise on what whole grains are why they are so healthy, interesting components that contain, that they contain, and how they contribute to our overall health. I encourage you to participate in the conversation with our experts and ask questions. I will hand things over now to your moderator for this evening, Dr. James, James House. Dr. James House is a professor and head of the Department of Food and Nutrition, uh, Human Nutrition Sciences in the Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences. Since joining the University of Manitoba in 1998, his research program has advanced our understanding of factors affecting the use of plant and animal-based protein sources in human diet. In 2018, Dr. House was elected as president for the Canadian Nutrition Society and currently serves as past president. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jayas, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to this session where we are going to engage in a lively discussion about whole grains. Um, we have uh, an excellent uh, slate of speakers lined up, but before we get started, I wanted to orient the audience with respect to how we're going to be asking questions tonight. So essentially, uh, we have a program that uh, we are going to be using called slido.com. And if you go to www.slido.com and then enter in the number uh, hashtag 5898, that will take you specifically to the Slido site for this evening's session. And what you'll be able to do there is to type in your question and then press send. And that question will be registered on the Slido site and we'll keep track of it as we go through this evening and be able to pose your questions to the panelists. So again, that is www.slido.com, hashtag 5898. Just a bit of an overview of how this Cafe Scientifique will operate. Uh, we have three panelists tonight, and each of our panelists will speak briefly on their perspective based on their expertise, expertise on tonight's topic, which includes a discussion around whole grains in Canada's food guide. I'll be moderating the questions from Slado and asking those uh, as after our presenters give their, their remarks. This brings me to tonight's expert panel. They are Dr. Carla Taylor, Dr. Peter Zaradka, and Ms. Getty Stewart and I'll introduce all of our, our panelists now. First off, uh, Dr. Carla Taylor is a professor in the Department of Food and Human Nutritional Sciences and is a team leader of the Canadian Centre for Agri-Food Research and Health and Medicine at the St. Boniface Hospital of Albrechtian Research Centre. And Carla's research program investigates how dietary compounds such as lipids and bioactive compounds found in plants and agricultural crops such as canola, pulses and buckwheat may be beneficial for the prevention and management of obesity, type 2 diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. Carla provides the nutritional sciences expertise in multidisciplinary projects, including clinical trials. Next, we have Dr. Peter Zaradka. Peter is a professor of physiology and 
pathophysiology at the Max Rady College of Medicine and a scientist at the Canadian Center for Agri-Food Research in Health and Medicine, again at the St. Boniface Hospital Albrechtian Research Center. His initial research examined new pharmaceutical approaches to treat vascular disease, but this expanded to include agricultural products when he began collaborating with Carla um, on the specific research projects. Dr. Zaratka's lab is engaged in the identification of novel bioactive compounds in buckwheat, various grains and pulses, for the management of diabetes, obesity, and atherosclerosis, and uses clinical trials to translate the results to humans. And finally, we have uh, Getty Stewart, and Getty Stewart is no stranger to the, to the community. She's a freelance professional home economist and a, an alumna of the University of Manitoba, providing tasty recipes, food preserving tips, and general food skills through writing, workshops, recipe development, media appearances, and her popular food blog, www.gettystewart.com. She is the author of the Prairie Fruits Cookbook, founder of Fruit Share, mom to two teenagers, and an avid gardener. Getty was raised on a grain farm in southwestern Manitoba, where she was surrounded by whole grains, but the idea of eating wheat kernels was very foreign, but not so much anymore. So before we go, we go to our panelists, I want to just orient our audience tonight on exactly what are we talking about, about Canada's food guide and the concept of whole grains. So this first slide is really just meant to orient you to uh, likely a familiar document that um, some of you may have seen in school or have been uh, seen in practice. This was Canada's food guide circa 2007 and highlights the various categories of, uh, of the food groups, including vegetables and fruits, grain products, milk and alternatives, and meat and alternatives. And in 2007, this was a, this was a common uh, document uh, up until just very recently when we introduced the new Canada's food guide and Health Canada introduced the, the new food guide in 2019, as we'll see in the next slide. And you can see a dramatic shift in the, in the imagery that's used to present Canada's food guide and the use of a whole plate model. And just to orient you on the plate, um, instead of having specific serving size recommendations for the day, it is basically a representation of proportions or, or a healthy dietary pattern. And within this dietary pattern, we see that half of the plate is made up of, of fruits and vegetables. A quarter of the plate is represented by protein foods with an emphasis to consume more plant-based proteins. And finally, the last quadrant on the plate is devoted to the choosing whole grain foods, which is the subject for tonight's uh, topic. And with this introduction of whole grain foods, we'll be asking some, some key questions and hopefully providing answers to these as, as we progress through this evening. And so some of the questions are, first of all, what, are, what do we mean by we say whole grains? Why are we focusing on whole grains? What are the benefits of choosing whole grains? And then finally, how do I incorporate whole grains into the diet? To start off, I'll just give a few examples through, through some pictures of, of exactly what uh, some ex uh, whole grains might look like. And so you can see what we're talking about are things like wheat kernels, oat, oat kernels, quinoa, buckwheat, etc. So there's a whole host of, of grains that would be considered uh, within our dietary pattern. But what we're really talking about when we're talking about whole grains is to ensure that the consumers have an understanding of the difference between a whole grain and a refined grain. So typically, if you're looking at a whole grain, it's a kernel that includes the bran, the endosperm, and the germ. The endosperm, uh, if you take a wheat kernel, for example, the endosperm is generally what is, uh, is converted to that beautiful white flower that we're all, that we're all uh, used to seeing uh, with, re with respect to uh, the production of uh, refined uh, of bakery products made from refined grains. However, when you, when you process grains to, and remove the bran and the germ fractions, you are actually removing components that um, do provide significant nutritional benefit. And so there is an increased emphasis within the Canada's Food Guide and an increased focus on the consumption of whole grains to ensure that the foods that we are consuming are providing these, these nutrients that we are aware of, for example, B vitamins and minerals, and some that we're just starting to learn about now, some bioactive components that we have in, in, these, in these plants. So to start the discussion tonight, uh, 
We'll start with Dr. Carla Taylor from, uh, uh, from the Department of Food and Human Nutritional Sciences and the Canadian Center for Agri-Food Research and Medicine. And Carla's going to give a, share with us her perspective on uh, the role of whole grains in a healthy diet. And uh, I'll just uh, turn the floor over to Carla now and then ask her to make her remarks. Okay, thank you very much, Jim. And I'm uh, excited to be here tonight and to have uh, this discussion with everyone. And I, I'll just start off a little bit more with uh, some definitions here, following up on what uh, Jim said. So the idea that a whole grain is, uh, we're looking at the whole kernel, it includes the outer husk versus when we have refined grains and we start processing, we remove oftentimes uh, that outer husk. And so if we start getting into examples, right, the difference between brown rice, which is a whole kernel versus white rice, which removes that outer husk. Uh, if we move on to wheat as an example, then it gets uh, a little bit more interesting. How do we actually eat wheat as a whole grain? And so this had me uh, this afternoon going and looking at the ingredient list for uh, crackers that I have on my shelf here at home. And what's really key is looking on the ingredient list to see that it says whole grain wheat, if you're looking uh, at a product that has wheat. And I was pleased to see that the one type of crackers anyhow, uh, did have uh, whole grain wheat. Now, you may be thinking, I mean, we all, many of us love to eat whole wheat bread. And really good choice, uh, helps get the benefits of um, um, the brand layer that's part of the whole wheat. But when wheat is um, milled generally now, uh, it's separating out the different fractions of the kernel as Jim was pointing out. And for whole wheat, it's typically now adding back the fractions such as the brand to make it uh, what we call whole wheat flour. Uh, and there's kind of a practical reason for that because we're trying, um, the food industry wants to improve the shelf life of um, products as well. So if uh, there's too much of the germ layer there, it affects uh, the shelf life. So that's often uh, a reason where um, processing comes in. But if we take this example a little bit further and you think of um, perhaps um, back in the day or maybe even currently, uh, if there's people that, um, small businesses that can do say stone ground wheat, uh, that could still be the whole kernel which is being ground uh, into a flour. And as we go through tonight's session and uh, we hear some more from Gaddy, we'll be get, um, hearing about some more practical examples about how we can uh, incorporate uh, the whole kernel or the whole grain into our diet. I guess the next big question um, for me, because I'm interested in the health benefits is, um, why do we want whole grain in our diet? And yes, the fiber is important, uh, the vitamins and minerals that are there are important, and also these bioactive compounds that we're just starting to learn about that probably have many health benefits as well. There's certainly very good research evidence that consuming diets that, continue, that contain whole grains uh, help reduce the risk of various chronic diseases. So cardiovascular disease, uh, certain types of cancers like colon cancer, uh, reducing the risk of type two diabetes. And thus there's many advantages of dietary fiber. And I'm just going to highlight uh, some of them. And uh, in the question and answers, we can get into a little bit more detail with some of these. Uh, certainly when we eat something which is a whole grain, it increases our satiety. Uh, it makes us feel fuller for a bit longer. And that has advantages for say, not maybe snacking quite as much because uh, it's half, half in, helping with our appetite control. And maybe long-term that also helps uh, with controlling body weight for some people. Another advantage of consuming the whole grains is better control of blood sugars. If we eat, um, a carbohydrate containing food that's mostly simple sugars, we get this very rapid and sharp spike in our blood sugars, and then it goes down quickly. But if we eat something which is a whole grain, there's a much slower rise in that blood glucose, and it says elevate it for perhaps longer, but it gives us uh, also that more uh, satisfied feeling and um, 
better control of blood sugars. And a tool that we can talk a little bit about later for how we can test foods out for uh, this effect and comparing the ones that say have um, this better aspect for controlling our blood sugars uh, is talking about glycemic index. Another uh, important aspect of eating fiber these days is how it affects our gut microbes. And probably uh, hearing a lot about uh, this these days. Um, for the microbes in our gut, fiber is food to them. And depending on what we eat, it's giving them different sources of substrates. And that can actually change the profile of what the gut microbes are. And certain profiles now are being associated with uh, better health and with uh, disease prevention. And some really neat uh, connections coming out in the research now about how uh, the gut microbes are linked in with our immune function and that there may be this connection between uh, our gut and the brain, a gut brain axis. Another part of the fermentation of these fibers by the gut microbes uh, is that they're producing uh, these short chain fatty acids. And these are a good source of uh, energy for the cells in our colon. And so this is one of the reasons that we think that fiber is uh, um, protective against certain types of cancers and particularly colon cancer. Okay. And then lastly, uh, dietary fiber being good for managing blood cholesterol. So blood cholesterol being a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Uh, and then of course, fiber uh, promoting regularity, preventing constipation and um, preventing uh, conditions say as diverticulosis. So lots of great reasons for having whole grains in our diet and uh, getting the advantages of dietary fiber. And I believe uh, our next discussant, Peter, will maybe delve in a little bit more about the bioactive compounds that are in whole grains. Great, thank you very much, Carla. Excellent, uh, excellent comments there. We look forward to exploring some of those concepts during the discussion period. Uh, I'll now ask uh, Peter Zaradka, um, who is a professor in physiology and pathophysiology and a, and a research scientist at the uh, at CCARM, the Canadian Centre for Agri-Food Research and Health and Medicine, uh, to provide comments on some of the, the biological activity of some of these unique components that we find in whole grains. Uh, Peter, I'll turn the microphone over to you. Thank you very much, Jim. It's nice to be here this evening, and I hope we have a good audience here with lots of good questions, because we like to be challenged, and uh, the challenge is the important part for any scientist. Now, whole grains are considered to be healthy with many beneficial effects on a variety of different chronic diseases. A number of these were discussed by Carla. Um, but these benefits usually are found through epidemiological or population studies but not with intervention studies. Typically, these are very different. Um, when you look at a population study, um, you're, you're looking at everything that they consume in comparison to a variety of different foods. And they are not generally looking at one particular food type or, par or particular whole grain. And how that grain is consumed is not very clear. Intervention studies tend to be very tightly controlled in, ter in terms of the type of food that's being given, how it's prepared, and making sure everything is consistent and the same for everybody. However, with a population, you can look at things that happen over decades, whereas for intervention studies, they usually aren't very long. You're talking about several weeks to several months, and that may not be enough to see the effects um, that you're going to have. The other part with population studies is that you may see the effects of food substitution, where positive effects come from higher amounts of whole grain in the diet, which means they may have uh, lower amounts of something that is more considered more unhealthy in the diet. Other factors that may affect what they do um, in the body are cooking, in terms of both time and temperature, processing, and it's interesting that um, a lot of whole grains are actually processed, ground up, 
parts of them separated and then mixed back together, but sometimes not in the same proportions as they are in the whole grain itself. Each part of the grain, as you saw with Jim's picture, contains different types of nutrients and different phytochemicals. And these are, phytochemicals are chemicals or, that are not nutrients, but they may affect your health. And the other part to realize, and this is something that I didn't know for a long time, whole grain is not the same as whole wheat, as an example. Um, so the, getting a whole wheat bread may not be the same as whole grain. Now, a lot of uh, interest has been in the relationship between whole grains and weight and diabetes and cardiovascular disease. I will touch on each of these individually. Currently, there is no evidence for an effect on weight or obesity. Um, this has been shown in a number of recent studies that really have taken it uh, very detailed in terms of looking at other studies that have been out there. Similarly, the evidence is not very strong for a uh, benefit for type 2 diabetes. However, most studies are not long enough to be able to see changes in hemoglobin A1c, which is considered the gold standard for seeing changes in glucose levels in the body. Interestingly, though, rye may be beneficial, but it may be because of its higher fiber content, which, like barley, uh, causes higher satiety when you eat it. Um, and that is another issue with some of these different types of studies. If you're looking at whole grain wheat, whole wheat versus whole barley versus whole buckwheat, they're, they're all completely different studies and they can't just be lumped under whole grains. Um, looking at the whole distribution of grains is one thing. Looking at the effects of specific grains in the diet is another thing. And there really have not been a lot of studies done with a lot of these individual types of whole grains. In, very nicely, though, uh, there is good evidence for decreasing colorectal cancer um, with whole grains in the f diet. Um, fiber tends to be considered the main reason, but it isn't always clear whether this is the case. There has not been enough research done to tell whether it's just the fiber content or whether there might be some specific components within the grain that might be very useful. Um, what has not been often seen, and there's only been a couple of studies looking at this, whole grain consumption may reduce fatty liver. And fatty liver disease is one of these things that is coming um, getting to be more pr prominent in the population. And it's a precursor to cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. So that's the number one liver cancer that's out there. Um, again, it may be the fiber that's causing this beneficial effect. And the links to this point suggest that the fiber may be working through the gut bacteria to change the immune capability of the of the body. And this is an important aspect associated with fatty liver disease. With respect to cardiovascular disease, the evidence right now goes both ways. There have been several studies that have shown a reduction in death and events such as heart attack and stroke in certain populations. However, there are some recent Cochrane studies and Cochrane studies tend to be gold standards for looking at multiple studies that are out there. And they found no effects on either outcomes, again, heart attacks or strokes, or the major risk factors of you know, cholesterol and blood pressure. I want to make it clear before I finish here that it is now evident that the, the basic thing that has to be looked at is events and outcomes. So whether somebody dies from a cardiovascular disease or they have a heart attack or stroke is much more important right now than looking at uh, risk factors. And I hope this gives some indication as to what is available out there for the information as to what they can do for you. And I'm certain that Getty is going to have some interesting uh, information for you on how you can use it in uh, your daily life. Thank you. 
Great, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, excellent information. And again, we look forward to exploring these concepts in more detail during the question period. Uh, before I turn the uh, the floor over to, uh, to to Getty, I just want to remind our audience that uh, if you wanted to ask questions, please use uh, the Slido tool, uh, www.slido.com and hashtag 5898 and you can type your question in there and send it and we'll have it available to uh, put to our panelists. Um, finally, I'd like to introduce um, Getty Stewart, who is a professional home economist, and Getty's going to uh, uh, provide us her perspective on all things whole grains and how to incorporate these into a healthy diet. So, so Getty, we look forward to hearing from you on this topic. Thank you so much and welcome everyone to our cafe. Um, as Jim mentioned it earlier on in the introductions, I grew up on a grain farm here in Manitoba and it is amazing the amount of grains that we grow here. And yet surprisingly, it never really dawned on us and my family to eat those whole grains as they are. So we'd ship the grains off and then we'd go to the store and we'd buy our refined grain products and that's what we put on the table. Um, and we, we're obviously not alone. Um, in, a, in a survey in 2015, um, Stats Canada shows that only about 20% of us are actually eating uh, whole grains in the rec recommended amounts that, uh, that the Canada's Guide recommends. So we're sorely lacking using whole grains in our diet, despite the health benefits that we just heard about from Carla and Peter. So, so what's the deal? Why are we not eating and adding more whole grains into, uh, into our diets? So one of the things that, that I'm looking at is how do I help, how do we help people figure out how to use more whole grains in their diet? And um, certainly we have become so accustomed to our refined, our easily accessible and available uh, grain products that I think we're not very familiar with our whole grains. So exposure to whole grains, adding them slowly and incorporating them um, into our diet as fits with our family's demands and our, and, and our cooking abilities and learning how to incorporate them into our diet. So uh, one of the things that, that I always encourage people is start where you're at. Don't try and go whole cold turkey and go whole hog and uh, and try and eat all the whole grains you can all at once. Um, it's not going to work. You're going to find resistance. If not you, then maybe your family members are going to say, whoa, that's way too, um, uh, too nutty, too crunchy, not soft enough uh, for me. So it's a gradual introduction that we're looking at. So take it slow. You know, you're, this is this is the long game. You don't have to do it all by the end of the month or by uh, by even by the end of the year. Take it one step at a time. Look at where you are now. Where could you add more whole grains to your uh, to your diet and start making changes um, the way that that suits you best. And I encourage you think about uh, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, all the meals. And so Canada's new new food guide as as uh, Dr. House showed us is all about looking at each plate every time we have a plate of food whether it's a small plate and a small snack whether it's our dinner plate or our breakfast uh, bowl um, look at that and see if one third of it can't be uh, made up of whole grains so at breakfast time it, you know if you're a toast person think about whole grain uh, alternatives and as as Dr. Carla mentioned uh, think of when you're looking at the label, it's important to read the back of the package where the ingredient label is and look for that whole grain wheat flour or whole grain rye flour or whole grain, insert the name of the grain that you're looking for, flour, um, rather than just whole wheat because uh, unfortunately here in, in Canada, whole wheat does not necessarily mean whole grain. Um, so that's an important tip uh, to remember. So you can uh, look for those whole grain uh, bread or um, baked product alternatives. Um, I certainly encourage home baking um, 
and using as much whole wheat flour, whole grain flour, um, if you can get your hands on it as possible. And if you can't get whole grain, you can always add in a little wheat germ or a little wheat bran to up the contents of uh, those outer layers that uh, Jim showed us that is often removed in our refined grains or in our whole wheat uh, product um, or flour. So looking at the, the, the replacing the breads, the toast, the, the muffins and, and those kinds of things, looking at some alternatives. If you are a hot oatmeal kind of uh, person, that's fantastic. Oats are a whole grain and you have lots of variety when it comes to choosing the different types of oats, the size of oats. They're all whole grains. Good news there. Um, if you are a cold cereal kind of breakfast person, then look for ingredients. Again, look for a whole grain uh, to be one of the top three ingredients in your cereal. Now, if you find that those cereals are just a little too much for you or your family member the members are revolting and saying, mom, I can't eat that, then, um, combine cereals and mix a little bit of the uh, of the cereals that they will eat with the whole grain uh, cereals so that uh, you're gradually introducing uh, some some changes and getting them on board think about uh, again instead of oatmeal you might try some some new grains some amaranth or some millet or some teff some of those smaller grains that cook up uh, into a beautiful porridge or maybe you could try a brown rice porridge from leftovers from uh, from last night so it's quick and easy so breakfast oh uh, i almost forgot if you're a pancake or waffle kind, uh, kind of person try adding a little bit of oat flour to your uh, to your uh, pancake mix or your or your batter and uh, oat flour if you can't find it in stores take your oat flakes Put them in a little uh, grinder and make your own uh, flour food processor. Um, I use my coffee grinder as uh, as a quick uh, a quick flour mill at, at home, especially for tender things like oat flakes. So that's breakfast. At lunch, think about your soups, your salads, your uh, your sandwiches. Again, trying to replace as much as you can, as much as you feel comfortable doing so. Um, from a taste preference, uh, replacing your breads, your wraps, your bagels uh, with the whole grain version. Um, again, just be really careful of that, uh, that marketing out there. Uh, you will find a lot of claims on the front of the package that say multi-grain or stone ground or ancient grains or 100% wheat. Those don't Usually when you see those labels, that's an indication that it's probably not a whole grain. Turn the package around, read the, those uh, ingredient labels, and, uh, and then choose those whole grain flour options. Um, so you're, you can, again, you can substitute. Uh, when you're having your soups, uh, look for whole grains inside. So try whole wheat couscous um, in, uh, in a salad or in a Buddha bowl. Um, try quinoa, try um, wheat and rye and uh, farro and frike, all different larger grains that hold up really nicely in a salad, really add that satiety that, uh, that both Carla and Peter were talking about gives you that full feeling and just adds amazing flavor and texture uh, texture as well to salads and to soups so we're adding it to our garden vegetable soup instead of chicken noodle soup maybe we have chicken brown rice soup um, and those kinds of things then when you're snacking afternoon snack time can't go without but again look for whole grain uh, alternatives look for those crackers just like Carla did uh, go into your cupboard check that ingredient list and then next time you're in the store see if you can do better and now that we're shopping online you've got a little bit more opportunity to to look at labels without the pressure of people around you um, so looking for uh, for crackers and uh, baked goods uh, again home homemade, I think, are, are better using the whole grains, using oats and, and those kinds of things. Um, and then at dinner time, looking at uh, replacing some of our pasta and our, our rice with brown rice, uh, a whole grain pasta. Um, and, you know, 
I, I, I hear you. My family too would prefer white rice over, uh, over brown rice. And so we compromise. There are some dishes that I will make where we will use white rice and then other dishes where it, uh, the rice becomes less of a star and is more incorporated into a dish um, or a cheesy casserole is a great place for whole wheat pasta if um, spaghetti and meat sauce isn't quite the selling point uh, where you can incorporate whole wheat pasta. So, you know, compromise, going and doing what you can as you can. You don't have to do it all at once. I know it's, uh, it, it's a challenge. It's a new way of thinking about uh, cooking. Whole grains often take a lot longer to cook. Um, so when you're talking the big grains like the hulled barley, the naked oats, the, the wheat berries, uh, the farro, those do take more than 30 minutes to cook. There are of course some quick cooking uh, uh, whole grains like your quinoa, your bulgur, um, your couscous, um, and make sure it's whole wheat couscous. Um, and uh, you know, those cook up super quick. So good tip for those larger whole grains is they freeze beautifully. So I always make an extra double or triple batch and at any given point in time, I'll have some in my freezer. So it's quick and easy to, to toss up a salad. So there you have it from morning to night, all the different options. Don't forget about your evening snack, a bowl of popcorn. You've got it made. That's a whole grain. And that's all for me right now. Great, thanks very much, Kitty. Excellent, excellent content. And I think uh, we look forward to engaging with you during this next section, which will be the, uh, the question and answer period. And certainly the, the questions are coming in fast and furious. And I'll, uh, I'll ask uh, uh, for all of our panelists to now, to now join us so that we can uh, start exploring some of these concepts that have, been, uh, that have been developing over the course of this evening. Um, so we've heard a lot about uh, about whole grains, the transition of uh, from the the former food guide to the new cannabis food guide, which has a pictorial representation of one quarter of the plate being represented by by whole grains. Um, no real reference to serving uh, serving uh, numbers of servings anymore, more about a pattern uh, in terms of whole grains. So with this emphasis on a healthy dietary pattern. Uh, we're getting a lot of questions about um, alternative dietary patterns. And so we're getting questions about, for example, um, the role of uh, whole grains in a keto diet, the role of whole grains in a uh, in low FODMAP uh, diets. Why don't, I, I know keto diets, are, are, um, the ketogenic diet is receiving a lot of interest. And I think that certainly um, if I were to 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 view that, it might be at odds with our discussion here about whole grains, but maybe I'll start with Carla. Did you want to comment on sort of that? Um, uh, the, first of all, what, what do we mean by a ketogenic diet? And uh, maybe put that in context with the discussion around whole grains and positioning those. Okay, so I think for a general definition of a keto diet, um, I would say that's a high protein diet which is usually also higher in fat because of the, the focus on the protein types of foods that are being emphasized in the diet. And, um, and most people are doing this, then it's low carbohydrates. So then avoiding, uh, quote, carbs, so avoiding grain type foods and so forth. So as a consequence of that, it becomes a low fiber diet. Uh, and so that's kind of in contrast to some of the advantages that we've been talking about so far with um, with high fiber. Uh, and also, say, missing out on some of the B vitamins and, say, folic acid that would come through uh, typically consuming, um, you know, the carbohydrate containing foods. Um, but having said that, I mean there. I mean there are research studies now following people for uh, a certain period of time. It's, I think now, you know, typically, you know, two to four months perhaps. And so, in in people who have metabolic certain metabolic conditions, maybe it's diabetes, for example, during that time there can be uh, an improvement in some of their metabolic parameters. 
but the concern is that none of these studies to date have really gone long term to see what happens long term. And it may also be to how well people can adhere to them long term. Uh, so sometimes maybe it, um, it motivates people to take a look at their diet and by avoiding some of their usual carbohydrate choices. So this kind of gets back to the comment that Peter made. Maybe they're starting to avoid um, some of the desserts and high sugar type foods, which they typically consume as carbohydrates. So kind of by removing them or de-emphasizing them in their diet, they're also reducing their caloric intake. And sometimes over time, people kind of, you know, have swung to maybe that more extreme diet, and then they start coming back a little bit more into the middle, which as nutritionists, we always end up being boring because we say we need to consume <laughs> all of the macronutrients and we need to consume them, uh, you know, kind of all in balance because our body, our body needs uh, protein, it needs fat, and it needs carbohydrate. Now, you're the one that said nutritionists are boring. And I, I, <laughs> I'm paraphrasing here, but let's uh, uh, let's ask for an exciting response from, from Getty, who's uh, who's been uh, living in the area of uh, home, home economics and and, trans and uh, extending knowledge in relationship to healthy dietary patterns uh, to consumers. Uh, what are your thoughts around the role that uh, whole grains could play in uh, in diets of those seeking to uh, move to, to sort of a uh, a, a lower uh, overall carbohydrate diet, um, any thoughts are around that? I, I think I think what we what we see often is um, is people are are desperately reaching for a, a quick solution or, or for a quick fix, um, and um, and diets come and and go. Uh, it is very difficult for people to stay in the in the ketosis um, that they're trying to achieve with the keto diet. And I and I hear so many people so frustrated uh, on that uh, on that journey and unable to uh, to sustain. And then they get frustrated and then they go go back to to old habits or different habits. And so I think it's really important for people to 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 choose a meal pattern that they can um, that they can adapt and use for the long game and for the for for long haul. And I think um, you know I've got to be with Carla on this one. Is is our bodies and our you know our ability to enjoy all the different foods. Of course, there are exceptions for people who have specific uh, intolerances or um, complications. But for for the general population, I think finding a, a good uh, meal plan, uh, a lifestyle that they can adapt and continue from now until forever, um, I, I think is a much better approach. And I think whole grains uh, have been shown to to play into that. Great. Uh, Peter, did you want to, to comment on this topic? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll add two things. First off, there are uh, grains that have higher levels of protein. Um, so that they probably can start to get incorporated into these kinds of diets to, to help out to some degree. And I expect over the next decade or so, uh, the protein content is going to go up in certain of these grains as well. So we're getting some alternatives to um, these high carbohydrate type of grains that you're seeing right now, uh, especially in the refined foot phase. Uh, the other part is, uh, physiologically, a lot of people go through fad diets. Um, one of the interesting ones is intermittent fasting, which in many respects can also put you into a, a slight ketogenic uh, state um, biochemically. And the big question is, is it possible for somebody to do it for a brief period of time, week or two, to help control their weight, because this is this is one of the diets that is really recommended for weight loss. Um, and then if they have had the experience of counting the calories, checking for carbohydrates and such like that, they're, the diet they might get into afterwards, once they start to, I won't say rebound, um, but change their diet back to one which contains a little bit more carbohydrate, 
they might be able to make better choices and replace the simple sugars uh, with whole grains instead to get that kind of diet under control and manage their weight better. Great, thanks. And certainly I think it, 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 it bears repeating that the Canada's Food Guide is really a dietary pattern for a healthy population. It's meant to, to reflect a, a, uh, a pattern that uh, will keep the population healthy. It's not necessarily a clinical pattern, uh, for mm -hmm. example, to, to uh, mitigate the, or to reduce the incidence of, of or sorry, to, uh, for, for example, for weight loss. And so I think um, when you're viewing Canada's Food Guide in that context, um, the, the role of, of whole grains, I think, is uh, should be emphasized uh, from the perspective that it is for the healthy population that we're viewing these dietary patterns. And certainly along those lines, I think there's other recommendations in Canada's Food Guide. And for folks that aren't familiar with the new Canada's Food Guide, we do have uh, the URL that's available for that, and we can put that up on the screen. It's uh, food-guide.canada.ca um, forward slash en. There are other... Uh, um, language versions of the food guide, which are now becoming available. Uh, but certainly if you wanted to access uh, the new Canada's food guide, it's available with uh, additional resources, tremendous amount of resources on the Health Canada website uh, related to the new food guide. Uh, but certainly as we're looking at uh, the new food guide, the recommendation of, um, of the, the one quarter of the plate, I think is, is one thing that um, we're getting some questions on. Uh, do you think it, it's, what's your opinion about the relative balance of this? The, the, the overall dietary pattern is designed to ensure that the population's you know, getting adequate fiber and adequate nutrients level. And I think the modeling that has happened has allowed for that definition of about approximately one quarter of the plate. Um, do you see, um, what, is your, what is your opinion of, of, of that particular representation? There are, people are, are wondering, is it too much or is it too, is it too little? Or is it the Goldilocks phenomenon where it's just right? <laughs> it's just right. You just need people. If, if people just actually practiced what was what was in that uh, on that plate, I think uh, I think we'd be we'd be going uh, we'd be doing much better than than we are. Okay. Um, there's a lot of questions that are coming out about processing. Um, so along two contexts, one is the role of processed foods in a healthy diet uh, and where whole grains fit within that, within that context. Uh, certainly there's guidance from, the, um, from Canada's Food Guide to avoid highly processed foods, but there are other types of processing that can, uh, can be positioned that would lead to lower levels of sodium, uh, saturated fats and sugars, which are the nutrients of concern that we're trying to avoid, which also happen to be fairly prevalent in a lot of refined grained uh, processed food products. And so I think that's part of the, uh, the goal of, of, a, of advocating for whole grain foods. Uh, but I'm just wondering, um, first off, uh, your thoughts about the role of processed foods in contributing whole grains? Um, I, we heard some good advice about what to look for on the label, for example, on, on processed foods. Um, and then the second thing, the role of actual processing, cooking on, um, on some of the, the whole grains and what impact that might have. Can we explore the first question first and then about uh, the role of uh, uh, processed food products in contributing whole grains? Certainly the picture on the, on the Canada's Food Guide does show a pasta, which is by definition a processed uh, a food product. Um, but your thoughts around the role of processed foods and contributing whole grains to the Canadian diet. I don't know if we want to start with Carla, if you want to. Yeah, so I, I think the message has been coming out, right, is to look at the ingredient label to ingredient list to understand um, what type of process like I guess whether the processing has allowed that there's still a whole grain component there or not right because I mean I I was pleasantly surprised I must say when I looked at this cracker box to see that it actually did say uh, whole grain wheat because I bet if I went to the grocery store many other boxes would have just said you know whole wheat flour or something along that line uh, so I um, so I think sometimes as consumers, I mean, that's kind of a tool that we have uh, uh, to work with. Uh, 
but I guess in in general, yes, when we're talking about processed foods, if we're talking about the type where it's, you know, addition of, you know, fat and sugar and whatever other um, flavors and textures, right, that make something taste good to us. And then we get into the terms now, ultra processed food and that. Um, I mean, that's, that's where we're um, potentially seeing some of the negatives in terms of the diet. And, uh, um, and it, there are the epidemiological studies now to show that people who eat a dietary pattern, which includes, um, you know, higher amounts of these processed and ultra processed foods are uh, at higher risk for the, the chronic uh, disease conditions and that. So, yeah, that, you know, that part is there. But I, and I mean, I think it is also thinking about our our dietary pattern like tonight we're focusing on grains and whole grains but i mean if we think of other foods in the way we're promoting in the in the diet now we're promoting it as whole foods uh and you know what what can we you know prepare at home in uh in easy and quick ways to um to achieve what we what we want to eat we certainly saw that during uh, the last uh, several months during COVID, uh, a lot of people exploring uh, new cooking and, and getting engaged with cooking at home. And um, certainly uh, probably a lot of, uh, uh, of recipe uh, formulations happening and, and unique combinations of foods being developed. Uh, Getty, did you want to comment on uh, uh, your perspective on the role of how processed foods, uh, whether or not do you, from your perspective, they play, play a role in contributing whole grains to the Canadian diet? Uh, you know, I'm I'm always pleasantly surprised that uh, consumers really do have an impact on uh, what products are being uh, what products are being made for uh, for us. And there is a slight increase in the amount of whole grains that you can find um, in the dry goods uh, part of larger grocery stores. Um, and what you, what I'm seeing now is pre-packaged, pre-cooked whole grains so that they're quicker uh, to cook at home. So for example, those wheat berries, they do take about 50 to 60 minutes to cook up at, at home. But now you, you can find um, pre-cooked versions that take that down to, to 30 minutes or, or less. You can find different, uh, different combination packs. So um, the onus is still on us to, re to read that label and to make sure that not that much else has been added to uh, to those grains. Um, and it does beg the question, I, and I think somebody asked that as well, that part two question is, um, when that happens, does it compromise the quality of, of the whole grain? That I don't know, maybe uh, maybe some of our other panel, panelists uh, know. But uh, here's a question for, uh, for Carla or Peter. As an example, um, something that most people are familiar with is oats. You have the um, steel cut oats, you have even you have naked oats, you have steel cut oats, you have large flake oats, you have quick cooking or, or quick oats, and then you have the instant uh, instant oats. Technically, they are all considered whole grains. Are they of equal health and nutritional value? That's a question I have. I have certain thoughts on that, but I'd love to hear you guys uh, answer on that. Okay, I, I, I will tackle that one first. Nice. <laughs> because um, it, it fits with one of the parts that I wanted to address for, for the question to begin with. Um, first off, when we're talking about the various ways that we can get whole grains into our diets, uh, the processing is a way of helping to put it into a position where it can be incorporated into more different types of formulations. And so it, it's in many respects, uh, the way that Jim put it, um, I, I would say that the most important part here is the recipe in which it, these whole grains are being used. Okay, so, so if you just had the whole grains themselves, that's one thing. If you have them set up in such a way that they are mixed into something that has high refined sugar, high fat levels, it's not going to do as much for your health as when you don't have all that fat and sugar with it. So, so that is one of the biggest problems about the, the processed foods and the refined foods, ultra-processed 
foods is that they have all of these other materials added that really de detract from the healthy benefits that you might get from the whole grains themselves. Um, part, of, part of the or one type of processing that is often uh, a big part of any kind of whole grain in terms of getting it into a formulation is milling. So how fine is that flour being produced to be able to mix it in um, or how, how coarse? And if you take think about whole grains and just taking some whole grains and putting them into your mouth, you, you know how much uh, effort that chewing is going to take to break through and everything like that. Um, in, in, a, in a study that we've recently published, but it's with, been with pulses, we found that really fine uh, ground pulses were not as effective for the health benefits of, associated with pulses as more coarse ground, coarse milled uh, pulses. So th that's, that's just a, an example of one type of food that just by changing how fine it is, the particle size you get, you get a different result in terms of how healthy they are. And to answer your question, Getty, realistically, you have to do a, a, a study with the oats in each of those forms before you can actually make any kind of claim for benefit or that it doesn't have a benefit. And, and that's the unfortunate part. This is all empirical. We have no formula that really can tell you one way or the other at this point. And there just aren't enough studies to be able to tell you one way or the other. <laughs> Yeah. And I think it's um, also important to have these variations, right, of what you're talking about as the different forms of oats compared with in the same study, right? Because oftentimes why we try, try to take a result from a study over here and another one and make some sort of interpretation with that. And ideally we need it compared under the same circumstances. Uh, and so just related to the question you, you posed, I, I've looked up what the glycemic index is of um, oatmeal porridge made with uh, either what they're saying rolled oats or with um, instant oats. Uh, and so we get different values, right? And so glycemic index is a way that um, we, we can test. So people fast, they come in in the morning, we get uh, their blood glucose, they consume the same amount of different food products on different days. And then we come up with this number to compare. And so the um, instant oat porridge has a much higher number for the glycemic index, saying that it's it's closer to white bread, which is typically the comparison, whereas the porridge made with um, the rolled oats, the large flake, have a much lower number. Uh, and that, and that kind of goes back to the concept that we were talking about that um, how we get more satiety and a slower rise in the um, blood sugars when we're consuming foods that are in their more whole form or as Peter's talking about knowing kind of what the particle size is of that food component uh, as well. Yeah, it's certainly the um, the components of the of the grain. When you're talking about the brand components and the germ components, they they can influence the overall ability of the nutrients or the bioactives to be digested. Uh, so it's not just the components of the grain, but also how they're processed. And so there's some questions coming in about cooking, for example, and how that might influence the. Um, the, the bioavailability or the availability of a particular nutrient or bioactive. Uh, do you have any uh, comments uh, to share with our audience about how cooking methods might influence um, how well a particular uh, bioactive, for example, is is released in the in the in the stomach or the, in the gastrointestinal tract and made available for uh, to do its to do the work either at the level of the mic with the microbes or being absorbed and having an influence on on body function. Uh, does anyone, uh, Carla or Peter, did you want to comment? Uh, well, I guess I'll, uh, I'll start. I mean, I mean, this is one of these things. That, I mean, it, it kind of depends, uh, and we, I mean, we have to test it out to find find out because there's uh, examples of nutrients or components which. Uh, the cooking process helps to release them or to make them become more bioavailable. Uh, 
And then there's other examples where the cooking process, if it's too long or depending on what the conditions are, actually start to break down that compound so that we lose the effectiveness of it when it gets into the gut. So, you know, so in, 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 unless we're talking of a specific example, it's 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 hard to know which which way that can go. Well, I, I think you can get it, make more of a general statement than that, Carla. Um, we, 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 we do know that, that if, if you're talking about bioactives, most of them tend to be in the hulls, which are, which are the, in the brand. That's the tougher parts of, of the seed, um, which, which means that anything that helps to soften that hull um, would tend to make it more bioavailable. Because other, otherwise, uh, if you're if you're just simply taking a whole grain, chewing it, breaking it down with your teeth, not not, not much happens with the stomach acid. Uh, not much happens in terms of the hull material in, in the small intestine. The, the fiber-rich material will go into the gut and get broken down by by the gut bacteria, and that's that's where the stuff will be released in some ways. But it may be being used by the bacteria as well. In some respects, that may be good to maintain healthy gut bacteria. Um, but if you're thinking about there are specific bioactives that may be in the hull that may have a specific benefit, so non-nutrition, but a health benefit on some component, some physiological component in the body, um, any kind of some t certain types of cooking may be very good for being able to release it earlier and make it more bioavailable. Great. Okay. Uh, well, Getty, certainly uh, there's lots of questions about, um, about cooking and um, how to encourage people to, um, to move to more healthy whole grain options. And just um, what advice do you have to encourage people to, um, to, to move to more healthy whole grain options away from, for example, uh, more uh, quick service, uh, uh, highly processed foods. Um, you gave some examples during uh, during your opening remarks, but do you have uh, uh, some suggestions for, for our audience tonight about uh, about some examples of how to, to make that transition? Yeah, I, th I think, um, you know, start at the easiest place where it is that you, that you can make changes. So um, if you are a baker at home um, and you think going whole, whole grain all the way is just going to ruin it for the rest of your family members, then go halfway and, and replace half of the, uh, the white flour with whole grain flour. Um, uh, one of the, one of the most friendly, uh, uh, ways of doing and incorporating whole grains. I think our oats um, are super easy to work with and to use, fairly familiar uh, to people. And, uh, you know, when you add that to baking, uh, when you when you grind it down into a flour, which is simply taking your large flake oats or your um, uh, your instant oats and putting it in a, a, spi a spice grinder or, or food processor and making it into a flour. So yes, we're making finer particles and we just talked about that, but you are still getting all of the components. Um, um, so you're breaking that down or maybe you only break down half of it just so that it's nice and palatable and you're making that transition slowly and bringing your, and I'm assuming you're bringing your family along uh, on the journey to becoming more whole grain uh, friendly. And it does take some time to make that transition from, you know, a white cupcake to a whole grain um, muffin. So um, take them on that journey gradually and give yourself a break when, uh, as you're baking and cooking as well, and just get getting familiar with that. Um, substituting, um, and again, you know, a, it may be difficult to go from white pasta to whole wheat pasta, but think of some uh, casserole or dishes where that's going to be easier, where they're not the star of the show, they're just kind of in there um, and use your whole wheat pasta in, in those kinds of things. Uh, and this is another uh, example where, you know, if going that whole uh, grain pasta isn't, uh, isn't in it for you, here's another question for Carla and Peter. Um, can I use the smart pasta or the enriched pasta? Is it a step better or is it just more refined 
uh, fine products? Or should I be going all the way to the whole grain? Um, what's your guys' thoughts on that? I get that question a lot. Okay. Could you just uh, explain a little bit more what the Smart Pasta product is? Like, is it with fiber added back into it? Is that... Yeah, so that, so there's fiber and it's enriched with vitamin uh, vitamin B and um, there are uh, added fiber and nutrients put back, but it looks very much like a white pasta. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, it, and I think it's, as you've described it, right, it's, it's giving the advantages over just the white pasta, right? So you're this journey you're talking about, you're kind of partway moving along. And, um, you know, I, I would say it's a, it's a better choice than just the white pasta in terms of getting the extra fiber and, and nutrients. And then maybe that'll lead to the transition to the, the whole grain pasta longer term. And, and there's plenty of times where, like I said, you know, um, family wants white rice. I want white rice for a particular dish because that's how I envision it being supposed to be uh, on my plate. And so we'll use white rice. But there are, are plenty of other options where I can use brown rice or wild rice or I can swap in some quinoa or I can add in uh, different grains and uh, change that expectation. Um, so so when when there's a clear expectation in the people that you're serving as to what this food is supposed to look like, um, that's a risky place to sub in. Uh, but if people are being introduced to a new food or something that where they don't have an expectation of what it's supposed to be like, and you put brown rice with that, or you put a little bit of um, frique or, uh, with that, then that's the way that dish is supposed to be, and they don't have a comparison. So uh, some of the new grain bowls or Buddha bowls that, that are becoming very popular, um, there, there's possibly a new recipe there for you that you can introduce to the family and there's no preconceived notions that you're trying to fight as well. So so maybe try that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what's interesting is once people make the transition and the whole wheat or the whole grain becomes their norm, going back once in a while and having the other version maybe isn't doesn't meet their expectations anymore, right? Right, so we, and all of a sudden it's like, this white rice is really bland, or, <laughs> you know, where's the chew, where's the bite, yeah. Well, we've talked a lot about the benefits of whole grains and incorporating whole grains into the diet. Um, are there any potential downsides uh, for focusing solely on whole grains? Um, I'll, I'll give one example. For example, the uh, some of our nutrition fortification strategies in Canada have relied on uh, the addition of folic acid to uh, enriched uh, white flour. Um, has that? Is there any concern um, that's been raised around uh, um, some of our strategies that we're using um, from a public health standpoint on, on fortification? I'm not sure if anyone wants to comment on that, or if this, it's just too early to to, to to comment there. Or I'll just open that up as a question. Uh, we've heard lots of good things about whole grains. I'm not sensing a lot of negatives, uh, but I just wanted to raise the opportunity for to play devil's advocate here. Yeah. Well, I think the example you just brought up, right, that's also, um, you know, part of Health Canada and so forth, monitoring what happens to the food patterns of Canadians. And, uh, right, I mean, the strategies initiated a number of years ago based on uh, uh, white flour, because that seemed to be the appropriate delivery system at the time, but maybe years going ahead will... We'll change our we'll change our mind on on what that delivery system needs to be. Uh, I also think um, people who are choosing uh, whole grains and becoming more conscious about healthy choices in their diets are also probably eating fruits and vegetables and other foods that are also important sources of these nutrients that we're talking about and uh, maybe they're getting them from their food choices and don't need to rely on uh, uh, fortif fortified foods the same. If you wanted to fortify and enrich everything, it's possible. 
there's there's nothing wrong with uh, fortification, which is adding something completely new um, that doesn't belong in that food into that food product, or enrichment, which is adding something back, which has been removed during the, the processing, but it normally is present. And that's just to clarify what those two things mean. Um, because uh, ideally, if anybody wanted to, they, they could eat anything they wanted and take a uh, one-a-day vitamin to, to get some of the, the most essential nutrients besides the, the macronutrients that they want. But at the same time, we're talking about Canada's food guide. And if you follow the food guide, you shouldn't need to have anything else extra <laughs> in your diet. It should all be present in the, the choices of the, the foods that you've used to fill each of those parts of the plate. Well, I think you just raised a topic for our next Cafe Scientific about the, <laughs> the opportunities and the, related to vitamins and minerals. And certainly uh, the use of supplements is a, is a question that uh, has raised a lot, of, a lot of interest in the minds of consumers. Um, a lot of questions are coming in. We talked about, um, about uh, the role that whole grains can play. Now, a number of these whole grains actually present with gluten. And uh, wheat is sort of a classic example of, uh, of, a, of a grain that has gluten in it. And gluten is the protein that provides the wonder, uh, wondrous properties uh, of um, extensibility and, and the ability for uh, breads to, to rise and capture the CO2 that's being produced from the yeast. So gluten is a very unique protein. Uh, but some people are sensitive to gluten, um, and it ranges all the way from gluten intolerance all the way through to celiac um, celiac disease. Uh, uh, Getty, any thoughts about recommendations for whole grains that may be uh, more su more suited for those that have to watch for gluten um, gluten containing grains? Yeah. So. Um the, the whole grain council actually includes some, um, uh, it's not just the cereal grains that we include in the definition of whole grains. So there are some um, grass seeds that are also included in this category of, of whole grains. So uh, you can, and, and I'm going to look at my list because when I talk and, and try and concentrate, sometimes the right things don't come out. So <laughs> so here's the list. Um, you, can, <laughs> you can try uh, amaranth. Uh, of course, brown rice, wild rice, uh, red rice. Uh, red rice is uh, is really interesting with some of um, the Asian Buddha bowls. Um, I really like I like uh, using it for that. Uh, buckwheat, uh, Carla and Peter, you guys are doing some research on buckwheat. It sounds like so, um, and that is also a Manitoba uh, grown um, uh, product. Um, uh, millet, uh, oats, of course, quinoa, um, teff, which is uh, a grass seed that comes out of uh, Ethiopia, um, uh, and yeah, wild rice, uh, sorg sorghum. Um, I, I've not used that in in cooking, but those are some some options that that you consider for uh, gluten free, and some of those are also. Um, for people looking for low FODMAPs, I noticed that there was a question about that. Um, some of those would also uh, work, uh, work, uh, work for that. Now, another surprising whole grain um, is corn. Um, and so that is another gluten-free uh, free option. Great, great, thanks. Uh, Carla and Peter, uh, Getty uh, gave a nice segue to uh, uh, some work that's being done on buckwheat that you want to uh, maybe Take a moment and just talk a little bit about um, some of the research that's happening in with that. Uh, I guess it's called a quasi cereal, is it not? Uh, I'm not sure the actual definition of, uh, of where it fits from a botanical standpoint, but uh, from a nutritional standpoint, buckwheat is is, is a grain. Um, did you want to maybe talk a little bit about some of the research that's happening in with that crop? Mm -hmm. And I'll open it to either one of you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'll I'll, I'll start. <laughs> Yeah, I know, because just the word buckwheat, right, is confusing to people because it's got nothing to do with wheat and it's not related to wheat, but uh, just because of the way uh, that it's named, right? And, uh, uh, you know, and, and I guess also um, some of the comments that Getty's made too, kind of allude to, right? I mean, from different cultural backgrounds, right? Certain types of grains have been used uh, more 
uh, more than others. And so um, uh, our, our interest in buckwheat has to do with how it uh, has compounds in it that are beneficial for controlling uh, blood sugars. And uh, so, so this is kind of along this idea of the bioactive uh, compounds again, and uh, um, you know how how you can uh, understand you know something which is locally grown in terms of having uh, potential for uh, helping to manage uh, a chronic disease. And I don't know, Peter, do you want to say a little bit more? Uh, one one of the interesting parts for for our research has been working with some of the buckwheat breeders, and we've been able to uh, help direct them in terms of what sort of cultivars they should be moving forward because they have higher levels of the the ingredient that we find seems to help with with blood sugars. Um, so so is that kind of back and forth between the research scientists and people who are growing it, uh, breeding it, and hopefully processing it at some point and, and making it into a product that's useful for the general public, that, that we, we like to be able to help out in this. And I think we provide some, can provide some good guidance if there's an interest in making something healthier than what it is to begin with. Question about cooking and the way I cook uh, buckwheat. Um, those of you who have cooked it, you know that it has this gelatinous um, sort of texture to it, um, and that can be a turnoff. I often rinse that gelatinous stuff off, and I'm wondering. Am I rinsing off the bioactive pro stuff that you guys are talking about? Am I wrecking it? <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but it's but I do like it. I do prefer buckwheat when I can isolate the individual kernels rather than having mm -hmm. it more, more like that goopy uh, uh, um, texture to it. Um, so I do rinse away the gelatinous uh, stuff and use it like uh, an individual kernel in um, salads and dishes like like that. But I also know that buckwheat is used in soba noodles, so it is again processed into a different form of noodles which again uh, to some of those Asian dishes and Asian flavors is a great um, uh, great add-on add-on there and certainly your comment about the sort of rinsing the buckwheat brings to mind this uh, this question of uh, back to the the idea of how cooking method influences uh, or may potentially influence the nutritional value or the bioactive value of the food product that's being prepared uh, certainly when you're cooking rice normally the rice uh, uh, all the water is absorbed but uh, for example although we're not necessarily talking about pulses tonight because pulses are legumes that fit in the in the other quarter of the plate on on the protein Protein foods category, um, certainly that's. Uh, uh, but pulses are sort of a unique, uh, unique product that um, that fit within you know the the protein category. They, they're kind of a vegetable. They're kind of a protein. They're kind of a grain. They have a lot of flexibility. Um, certainly, if you're cooking those and the water changes color, um, some of that you can tell that you're pulling out some of those powerful uh, components that have antioxidant uh, properties. And that might be a question about how cooking methods of grains might influence whether or not you're retaining some of those nutrients. And so if you're throwing water away, um, maybe you're also throwing some of the nutritive value away as well. So maybe think about how to, to, to keep some of that gelatinous material <laughs> So, so maybe the compromise is for breakfast I eat buckwheat cereal and for dinner I have a buckwheat salad bowl with individual kernels. Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so and actually I think that that's a really uh, good uh, message is, um, you know, there are compromises and trade-offs and just the, the variety and doing things in different ways probably in itself has uh, has some benefits. So where you're amping up the one thing, just like carrots, you know, sometimes they're better cooked um, than you and you get different benefits than if, if you eat them raw. So, um, but doing both, you get the best, best of both worlds, right? Right, right. 
And certainly, I'd like to just come back to a comment that Peter made earlier about working with with breeders, and I think that uh, that highlights the the power of the of this whole agri-food system approach to looking at uh, uh, at enhancing the nutritive value of our of our food supply and our local food supply, and working uh, with the various sectors in a transdisciplinary fashion. So you you've got nutritionists working with plant breeders, working with food processors, working with home economists to to, to look at how to enhance enhance um, overall the end goal of creating a sustainable food system that provides uh, um, healthy foods for the population. And I think it's a, there's, there's power in that approach. And we've got lots of examples here in Manitoba of the, of the community working together to, to advance that. And uh, Peter, you gave the example of uh, increased grains with protein. There was a question about, uh, I'm not sure if you have any examples of some of these grains that, uh, uh, that are looking to, to be positioned with a higher protein content. Uh, uh, no, not not specifically. I don't. <laughs> but certainly, I think um, as as there's a lot of variability in the protein content in the grains category, and I think people forget, even though we've got that protein category on the plate, um, we actually get a fair bit of our dietary protein from the grains category because we just happen to eat a lot of them, and they have they have a significant amount of protein and they contribute a significant amount of protein to our diet. Um, and certainly there are efforts underway to look at selecting of crops and, and understanding agronomy practices that will enhance the protein value of those foods. Um, so I think it, it, this, whole of, this whole of the food system perspective um, and in thinking about whole grains is, is uh, I think there's a lot of interesting things happening. And so I think the, the, it'll be interesting to see how this progresses over the next uh, next couple of years. Uh, we've got a few more minutes left of, of questioning, and uh, I'll give the uh, the panelists a few uh, a chance right now. If there's any questions that you wanted to ask of each other at this stage, and uh, I see if there's other questions that have that have popped up. Um, at this stage, uh, uh, certainly we've got um, a number of questions around um, uh, intermittent fasting. I'm not sure if uh, if um, Carla. I'm not sure if you wanted to, to tackle that topic. Um, it's it's another it's another one in the in the uh, in terms of a dietary uh, dietary pattern that uh, there's a lot of interest in right now, uh, is there a role for whole grains to play within intermittent fasting? Um, so I'm, I must say I'm I have a somewhat limited knowledge, but I also realize that intermittent fasting can mean different things to different people. So whether it's within a certain portion of each day that there's no food consumption or whether it means that someone goes for uh, a whole day without food consumption. So there's there's many variations on that. Um, but I guess the, the and because of because of what I teach, I'm always thinking of what's happening in the body. Certainly our carbohydrate intake uh, and grains intake is important for the glycogen stores that we have in our buildings or have in our body um, because glycogen is um, what we break down when we're fasting. So we break down our liver glycogen to maintain our blood glucose. And so there's always uh, an important role for our, our carbohydrate intake that way. And, uh, and then that's why there's also some guidelines around um, uh, what should perhaps be a minimum carbohydrate intake per day so that uh, uh, we're providing our bodies with enough uh, carbohydrate to uh, maintain our blood glucose and that. So, um, so from that perspective, yes, I think, you know, whole grains uh, uh, are part of that. And, um, and, and I think it is quite interesting. I mean, when we think of, you know, breakfast, right, breaking our fast, uh, uh, you know, if we look across many different cultures, right, what's consumed for breakfast uh, usually uh, has the carbohydrate component to it. Great, great. A uh, couple more minutes of, of questions. And there's one that um, uh, maybe I'll position this to, to Getty in terms of, accessing um, whole grains. Uh, what's your recommendation now that people are inspired to include more whole grains in their diets tonight, hopefully, uh, through the question talking about the, the benefits of whole grains and the, and the novel components that they add to the diet. If people want to find them, uh, what, what are some suggestions that you might have for identifying whole grains in, uh, um, 
it, 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 within the province or wherever our or wherever our guests might be uh, uh, tuning in from tonight. Yeah, well, let's well let's start local and let's talk. I, I mean, uh, the age of COVID, we really are talking a lot about supporting local and small businesses. And here's our here's another chance uh, by purchasing our whole grains from local growers and 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 producers and looking for Manitoba options. So we have the wheat, the naked oats, the hull barley, um, local prairie quinoa, um, buckwheat. Um, uh, oats, uh, all different variations of, of that available locally grown here. Um, and so looking at, at farmers markets, uh, our smaller shops, our local shops, um, wherever you are in, in Manitoba, there is a grain CSA that you can, that you can take part of and, um, and access a whole bunch of different, uh, different whole, whole grains. So, um, shop local if you, if you can and if you can it can source those things a few google searches or if you want to contact me i can i can send you to uh, to the right places there um and then if you are looking at the next size uh, store some of our local retail shops um that specialize in um in organic or special food will also offer some of these uh, locally sourced uh, grains and products and then if you're looking in the larger uh, grocery stores and retail stores looking at, again at the um, organic section and it's not necessarily that i would you know, recommend organic over non non organic. I think uh, I think they all have a have a place in in our diet. But that's just the section where you're going to find different types of uh, of whole grains. So looking um, at at those in your large super supermarkets and uh, your your smaller corner store uh, groceries as well. Um, if you're having real difficulty, um, oats, quinoa. Those are those are readily available now, and you're, we're seeing more of the different types of wheat and wheat-like products, like the frike, the farro, um, uh, becoming available as well. Bulgur, um, couscous, and uh, don't forget that many of those those rices, specialty rices like jasmine rice or basmati, those come in the whole grain format as uh, as well. In fact, they start off as a whole grain, so those are not the exceptions. Um, even though sometimes we think, oh, wow, look, this comes in whole grain. It's like, well, it started as that. So, <laughs> um, yes, you can find them as the as the whole grain version. So so try those in some of your new recipes. Great advice. Thanks, Getty. Well, just in the, in the last uh, minute or so that we have left, I'll just give an opportunity for each of our panelists if they wanted to make a, a final comment. Peter, the, any, any final comments or words of wisdom for our audience tonight? Um. Eat the whole grains. That, that, that's one <laughs> of the things I would, I would, <laughs> I would certainly advocate. Um, even though um, my wife would probably be snickering at me because it, it's not the form that I prefer to have my grains in. <laughs> I think you're not alone in that, but uh, everything, it, it's baby steps, right, Getty? <laughs> yep. any, final, any final thoughts that you'd like to leave with our audience tonight, Getty? Um, you know, there are some fantastic recipes. Um, I, there's a few uh, on, on my site. And if you do have questions about how to cook whole grains, I've got some information on, on that. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions and go through uh, through that because we want to get that, that percentage where only 20% of us are meeting those whole grain requirements. Let's bump that up. Let's let's make a move in the right direction and add more whole grains to our diet. So as Peter said, eat those whole grains. Great, thank you. And Carla, I'll leave the last comments to you. Uh, well, I, it, it, this, has been, this has been great. And I mean, it, it also motivates me personally, um, right? Because I mean, I mean that, that's how we all make changes, right? Is uh, to get motivated by something and think, you know, yeah, you know, starting uh, in the next few days or the next week, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, Try and try out another new whole grain, or you know, see what I can do. And I mean, it's just one small step at a time. That's that's how we make changes. 
great words of encouragement. And I want to thank you all on behalf of the audience and behalf of uh, uh, the university and, and the Cafe Scientific platform for taking time out today to discuss this issue on whole grains and providing your perspective and excellent information for our audience. And so again, thank you very much for your participation. And for our audience tonight, in closing, I'd like to thank you for engaging in tonight's discussion. I hope you found it informative and got as much out of it as I did. Uh, like Dr. Taylor, I'm feeling inspired to, uh, to look at whole grains. Um, I encourage you to tune in again in 2021 for our first session taking place on January the 19th at 7 p.m. And it's entitled, What Does COVID-19 Immunity Look Like? Certainly a topic that resonates with all of us. Uh, details on this and additional 2021 Cafe Scientific can be found at umanitoba.ca Cafe Scientific, as well as a link to the video of tonight's discussion which will be posted in a few days. With that, I'm wishing you all the best. Um, stay safe, thank you, and have a good evening. Bye-bye.